Today we're going to talk about how the other half lives. And by the other half, I'm referring to the organisms on this planet that are able to make energy from sunlight. Those organisms are photosynthetic. Organisms like cyanobacteria and algae and plants are able to harvest energy from sunlight and through a process called photosynthesis, turn that energy into chemical energy that can be used by them as well as other organisms to maintain their life. Today we're talking about photosynthesis, so stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about arguably the most important metabolic process to evolve since the beginning of life on Earth photosynthesis. As far as we can tell, photosynthesis evolved a few billion years ago in the ancestors of modern day cyanobacteria and algae and plants, which still perform photosynthesis to this day. And over that time period, the process has been modified slightly by the organisms that perform it, but the basic principles of it still hold true to this day. Photosynthetic organisms have pigments that exist within their cells. If we're talking about a cyanobacterium, those pigment molecules are going to be found in the cytoplasm. But if we're talking about eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, such as algae and plants, you're going to find those pigments located in an organelle called the chloroplast. Bottom line, when it comes to photosynthesis, the process is remarkably simple. Photosynthetic organisms are going to take the energy from sunlight, capture it in pigment molecules, and use that energy to convert carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates that can then go on and be used as an energy source or to help build that particular organism up. Furthermore, that chemical energy that is trapped by those, by those photosynthetic organisms serves as the basis for over 99% of food webs on the planet Earth. And in fact, without the process of photosynthesis, many things about modern Earth would not be true. For example, without the evolution of photosynthesis in these organisms, there would be no oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. The fact that the current Earth oxygen, oxygen in the atmosphere is about 21% is directly due to the fact that there are millions of organisms on this planet that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Similarly, if we didn't have photosynthetic organisms, about 99% of modern food webs could not exist, since modern food webs consist largely of photosynthetic organisms at the base and then other organisms that consume those photosynthetic organisms as a food source as you move up the food chain. Now, like I said before, the overall process of photosynthesis is remarkably well conserved. So let's talk a little bit how the process works. And if we're going to understand how photosynthesis works, we first need to learn a little bit about the behavior of light. First off, visible light is nothing more than a narrow band of energy on the overall electromagnetic spectrum. So when we talk about visible light, we're talking about, we're talking about a form of energy, and as such, Light actually does behave many, in many ways like a wave, and you can have a waveform for any type of visible light that you want. And if you look at the waveform of light, you can actually measure that particular light in the form of wavelengths by measuring from the crest of each of the consecutive waves. We measure that distance typically in units called nanometers. And what's interesting is the different wavelengths of light give off different colors. At least that's how our bodies perceive it. That's how our eyes and our brain interpret energy on the visible light spectrum. And as you can see, depending on what wavelength of light you're looking at depends on what color your body perceives it to be. Now, like all forms of energy, by measuring the wavelength, you can actually determine the amount of energy in that particular wavelength of light. When we look at the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of the visible light band, we can see that violet light actually has the shorter wavelengths and is, thus contains more energy and at the other end of the visible light spectrum, we have longer wavelengths of light that are interpreted as red, which have less energy. But in some cases, light can actually function like a particle. And when light's behaving like a particle, we refer to these discrete units of energy delivered by light as photons. And it's photons of light that are actually captured by the pigment molecules we find in photosynthetic organisms. Now, photosynthetic organisms often contain different pigment molecules, several different pigment molecules, including uh, two different types of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, as well as other accessory pigments like uh, beta carotene and uh, zeaxanthin and, and lycopene, uh, which also absorb light within the visible light spectrum. Now, what's interesting about pigment molecules is depending on the structure of the molecule, 
uh, that will impact what wavelengths of light they're able to absorb and which, in, which wavelengths of light they tend to reflect. So for example, chlorophyll, if we look at, at a, uh, an absorption spectrum from chlorophyll molecules, you can see that they have uh, various peaks and valleys. And where you see the peaks on this particular graph, this is where the chlorophyll molecules are best able to absorb photons of light. And where you see the troughs, this is where you see that light is typically not absor being absorbed by these pigment molecules. In most cases, these are being reflected. In fact, if you look at chlorophyll, for example, you'll see that at these particular wavelengths, the light that, is be that, light that chlorophyll is receiving is actually not being absorbed. In fact, it's being reflected. These wavelengths of light actually correspond with the wavelengths of green light, which is why organisms that are photosynthetic and contain chlorophyll appear to be green because that's the light being reflected back at you by these particular pigment molecules. If a pigment molecule is exposed to light of wavelengths that are uh, farther, farther below or that are shorter than they can, than they can receive, uh, typically what happens there is uh, they can actually be so powerful that they can bleach out those particular pigments. This is where accessory pigments come in. So for example, things like beta carotene um, and lycopene and zeaxanthin exist in many molecules or many photosynthetic organisms because they can actually absorb some of that more harmful light um, so that the chlorophyll molecules don't get bleached out by overexposure. And on the other end, if the wavelengths of light are too short, then they can't actually be absorbed by the pigment molecules. The reason for this has to do with what happens when those photons of light are absorbed. When photons of light are absorbed by pigment molecules, they act to excite various electrons that exist within the molecule. If the wavelength of light is too short and there's too much energy that can actually destroy that particular molecule by kind of blasting those electrons completely away rather than exciting them. If the wavelengths of light are too long, then there's not enough energy within that particular light to excite the electrons in the first place and nothing actually happens. So now we know how light behaves and how pigment molecules are actually able to absorb energy in the form of photons of light. Let's talk about the overall process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is going to happen in two different cycles. It's going to involve a group of reactions that are referred to as the light reactions or the light dependent reactions. These reactions are going to happen in the cytoplasm of photosynthetic prokaryotes like cyanobacteria. But if we're going to focus mainly on the eukaryotic organisms that perform photosynthesis like plants and algae, this is all going to happen within a, an organelle called the chloroplast. Now the chloroplast is a lot like mitochondria in that it's a double membraned organelle contains its own DNA. It's of endosymbiotic origin. But if you look inside the chloroplast, what you're actually going to see are several structures that are called thylakoids. And those thylakoids actually stack upon themselves to form larger structures called grana. Now surrounding that thylakoid is a viscous, almost like cytoplasm-like fluid that's called the stroma. And both of these locations are going to be important. The light-dependent reactions are actually going to occur inside the thylakoid membranes. On the other hand, the other type of reaction, which are often called the light independent reactions, also known as the Calvin cycle, are going to happen in the stroma. We prefer the term Calvin cycle because these reactions are not truly light independent. Many of the enzymes that are involved in the process actually need to be activated by the presence of light in order to perform their duties. But they get the name light independent reactions because there's no direct input of light needed for those reactions to occur with the exception of that needed to activate the enzymes. On the other hand, the light dependent reactions are where light is going to be absorbed in order to create the, the reagents needed for the Calvin cycle to take place. And that's exactly what happens in the light reactions. During the light reactions, we are going to take energy from sunlight, use it to create molecules such as ATP and NADPH, which will then be utilized during the Calvin cycle in order to, to fix carbon dioxide and turn it into carbohydrate energy. So let's start by talking about what happens in the light reactions. Well, with the light reactions, they're basically summarized this way. You're going to have two photosystems that capture light. Those will be connected to each other by an electron transport chain. And once they've completed their task, they will have created the NADPH and ATP needed to be utilized in the Calvin cycle. So let's start by looking at what the photosystems look like. Now, when we talk about photosynthesis, there are actually going to be two photosystems, photosystem one and photosystem two. They're not actually going to work in that order, but they're remarkably similar in terms of what they look like. 
Photosystems are structured like this. On the outside of the photosystem, you're going to have a light harvesting complex. Inside this light harvesting complex, you are going to have chlorophyll molecules as well as other pigment molecules that will capture energy from sunlight. The energy from that sunlight will then uh, be used to excite electrons on those chlorophyll molecules. And essentially this energy will be ping ponging around from chlorophyll molecule to chlorophyll molecule until they get bounced into the center of the photosystem, which is called the reaction center. And inside the reaction center, you will find two specialized chlorophyll molecules that will absorb that energy. Once that energy is absorbed, that energy will be used to excite two electrons off of those specialized chlorophyll molecules, and they will be passed to something called the primary electron acceptor. Now, photosystem one and photosystem two are slightly different from each other, and depending on which wavelengths of light they tend to be excited best by. So the photosystem two, which actually occurs first in the order of photosynthesis, is called the P680 complex because of the wavelengths of light that it absorbs best. And the other photosystem, photosystem one, which occurs second in the order of photosynthesis actually, uh, absorbs light at the 700 nanometer, nanometer wavelength, which is why it's called the P700 complex. Nevertheless, the overall process is remarkably conserved. So let's talk about the light reactions all the way through the process. So if we're going to start at photosystem two, and that's where we begin, this is one of those examples where in science, sometimes things are named in the order in which they're discovered, photosystem one, not in the order in which they actually occur, photosystem two. So light will hit the the light harvesting complex of photosystem two and light energy will be absorbed by those chlorophyll molecules. Uh, alternately exciting electrons and then passing that energy to the next chlorophyll molecule in the chain, exciting those electrons and so on and so forth. And the energy from that light ping pongs around to various chlorophyll molecules until it reaches the reaction center, at which point that energy will be transferred to the two specialized chlorophyll molecules in the middle of the reaction center. This will actually excite those electrons to such a point where those electrons will be ejected from those chlorophyll molecules. Those ejected electrons will then be passed to something called the primary electron acceptor, which will then pass them on to the electron transport chain. But before we move along with those electrons, let's talk about what just happened. During this process, those electrons were taken away from those two specialized chlorophyll molecules. In other words, they have been oxidized. They have lost electrons. So in losing those electrons, those oxidized chlorophyll molecules are actually one of the most electronegative substances on the planet of Earth. And what that means is, remember, electronegativity is the inherent desire that an atom or a molecule has for electrons. In other words, these specialized chlorophyll molecules want electrons and they want them bad. They want them so badly and they are so electronegative that they are actually able to steal them from molecules of water. Remember that water is one of the primary ingredients needed for photosynthesis to happen. And here's why. These specialized chlorophyll molecules, once they become oxidized, are electronegative enough to remove electrons from water. And in doing so, they will replenish the two electrons that they lost due to the excitation by sunlight. However, by stealing those electrons away, they are going to generate two electronless hydrogen atoms, which are now just simply a single proton, as well as a molecule of oxygen, which to plants is a waste product, but to us is one of the key components we need to actually survive. So what happens to the oxygen? Well, the oxygen is actually going to leave. It's just going to diffuse out of that cell and back into the environment where heterotrophs like us are going to be very excited to get it. Those protons, however, have now been sort of ejected from the process and they're now floating around in the thylakoid lumen. In other words, they're trapped inside the thylakoid lumen. We're going to leave them there for a minute. We're going to come back to them in a minute. And if you know that there's an electron transport chain coming next, you can probably guess where we're going with this process, but hold on, we'll get there. Now those two electrons that have been passed on to the primary electron acceptor, where are they going to go? Well, exactly what happens uh, when we look at the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. Those electrons will then be passed to a series of electron transport chain complexes. And in at least one of them, protons are going to be pumped across the membrane using the energy of the transfer of those electrons from one complex to the next to the next. So in other words, what we've done now through the photolysis of water, which is what happened when water was broken apart by those specialized chlorophyll molecules, and through the action of the electron transport chain is we have now created a proton gradient 
inside the thylakoid lumen. And those protons are trapped there by the thylakoid membrane because they are hydrophilic enough where they can't cross that biological membrane. Again, we're going to leave that proton gradient there for a second and talk about what happened with those electrons. Now, those electrons, their final destination is actually photosystem one. Remember, photosystem two first, then an electron transport chain, and now we're at photosystem one. Why are they at photosystem one? What's going to happen at photosystem one is very similar to what's going to, what happened at photosystem two. A photon of light will strike the light, strike the light harvesting complex. It will excite electrons on the chlorophyll molecules contained in that light harvesting complex. That energy will be ping-ponged around to various chlorophyll molecules until it reaches the two specialized chlorophyll molecules in the reaction center of photosystem one. This energy will then cause two electrons to be ejected from those specialized chlorophyll molecules and be handed to a molecule called ferredoxin. Ferredoxin will then deliver it to an enzyme complex called ferredoxin NADP reductase, or FNR. And those electrons will then be passed to an electron carrier called NADP to yield something called NADPH. And you can think of NADPH as analogous to NADH or FADH2 in chemoheterotrophs or in the respiration process. Now, of course, those two specialized chlorophyll molecules sitting inside the reaction center of photosystem one, which have been oxidized, now also would like to have their, react their electrons replaced. Well, instead of taking them from water this time, those electrons will re be replaced by those electrons that just traveled through the electron transport chain. So in the end, we sort of replace those two electrons for with the electrons that were originally stolen from those specialized chlorophyll molecules sitting in the reaction center of photosystem two. Now, the, the key molecule that we've produced through this process so far is NADPH. And NADPH basically represents electrons. And that NADPH will be utilized by the Calvin cycle in the next step to help generate carbohydrates. So let's go back to that proton gradient. Well, that proton gradient still exists, right? We've pumped electrons in there. Some of them came from water, uh, from photolysis, and other ones have come there by being pumped by the electron transport chain. So how are we going to utilize these? the exact same way we utilize them in the mitochondria. Their ATP synthase exists in the, in the thylakoid membrane, or I guess in the, in the biological membrane of prokaryotes, and it will allow elect those protons to come back across that biological membrane by harvesting the potential energy created by that electrochemical gradient and utilizing it to perform key osmosis to generate ATP from ADP and an inorganic phosphate. At this point, the light-dependent reactions are complete. We have generated NADPH, which are electrons, which will be utilized in the Calvin cycle, and we've generated ATP, the energy molecule that's going to be needed to power those endergonic reactions that are going to take place in the Calvin cycle. What's really neat about this is the orientation of the whole process. What's cool about this is that all of these molecules, ATP and NADPH, are actually produced on the stroma side of the thylakoid membrane, meaning they're already in the compartment of the chloroplast where you would like them to be. Because remember, the Calvin cycle reactions are going to take place in the stroma of the chloroplast, not inside the thylakoid. So the Calvin cycle is going to work like this. The Calvin cycle is actually going to occur in three distinct phases. The first stage is called carbon fixation, and this is where carbon dioxide becomes incorporated into the process. Next step is called reduction, and the final step is called regeneration. Now remember, this is actually a cycle, so we're going to end up with uh, the same molecules we actually started with, plus, as you'll see, about half an equivalent of glucose, because this particular process is marvelously inefficient. So the process starts like this. We will start with three five-carbon molecules called ribulose bisphosphate. These three five-carbon molecules will combine with three carbon dioxides and interact with an enzyme that, due to its lengthy, complex name, is simply abbreviated as Rubisco. Rubisco will then take the three five-carbon RUBPs and combine it with three carbon dioxides to yield six three-carbon molecules called 3-phosphoglycerate. Three 3-phosphoglycerate three will also receive two or will also receive an addition, each of those will receive an additional phosphate group through the hydrolysis of ATP to yield three molecules of 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate.
So let's keep in track of where we are. We've taken three carbon dioxides, incorporated them with three five carbon molecules, and kind of twisted them around to yield six three carbon molecules. Now we're okay in terms of our balanced equation because we still have 18 carbons. We had three times five to begin with for 15 plus three times one, three carbon dioxides. So that gives us 18 total carbons. We've just rearranged them to make six three carbon molecules of one three bisphosphoglycerate. The next step in the process is called reduction. And remember reduction is gaining. What are we gaining? Well, we're gaining electrons. This is where NADPH comes in. So we're going to take these three or these six 1,3 bisphosphoglycerates and we're going to give them electrons. This will come at the cost of six NADPH. We've now reduced those six 1,3 bisphosphoglycerates and we now have six molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or G3P. You may remember that from the midpoint of glycolysis, same molecule. Now, those, of those six glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates, one of those will be removed, and that will be the net product of the Calvin cycle. Now, keep in mind that glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is essentially half of a glucose. So we haven't even made a whole glucose yet, we've made half a glucose. The remaining five glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates will go to the next phase, which is regeneration. And in regeneration, we are going to use three ATPs to recombine those molecules to again yield ribulose bisphosphate to end up basically back where we started. Now let's keep track of exactly what just happened. To generate half of a glucose molecule, we spent six NADPH, three carbon dioxides, and, and nine molecules of ATP. That, however, is the cost of doing business when it comes to photosynthesis. We have to do that process all over again if we're hoping to generate even one glucose equivalent by generating another molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is why I said that the Calvin cycle is a remarkably, marvelously inefficient process. But nevertheless, without this process, life on Earth as we know it could never exist. So there you have it, a quick rundown of photosynthesis, which is arguably the most important metabolic pathway that exists on the planet Earth. Without photosynthetic organisms, those aerobic organisms like us could never have existed in the first place. Even though the process is remarkably inefficient, it is essential for life as we know it. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys learned a lot today, and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye!